بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last time we talked about the categories where the beneficiaries of zakat, the eight categories, are considered. Denying zakat. So, denying zakat and withholding zakat are two different things. Any person that denies something that is known to be part of Islam, the, 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 the fuqaha and the scholars call it which means that it is known out of default that it is part of Islam. Anyone who denies this is an apostate, it's a disbeliever. So a person who prays, fasts, gives zakat, performs hajj, but says, I do not believe in the Day of Judgment. I do not believe in the existence of heaven and hell. A person, the punishment that are mentioned in the Quran. So he says, no, I don't believe in chopping off the hand of a thief after fulfilling the conditions or in flogging a person who slanders an innocent person without providing proof. I don't believe in the prescribed, I do not believe in a religion that endorses such harsh and barbaric punishments. Such a person is automatically a kafir for denying something that is well known from the religion. and. There is an issue between someone who is ignorant and someone who's arrogant. And there is a difference between ignorance in the land of Islam and ignorance outside the land of Islam. So a person comes to me and I, he says, listen, for the past 10 years, I reverted to Islam, but I never took a uh, ghusl because I never thought that it was mandatory upon me to take ghusl. So, subhanallah, this is something that every Muslim knows, but because you were living in America and you did not know, and probably you didn't have the means and tools to learn, we would say that this is out of, uh, of ignorance. Rather than someone coming and saying, no, I'm not going to pray. Why? said, I don't want to bend over and put my head on the ground which I step on. This is ridiculous. This is a kafir. Because what he's doing is definitely something that shows he does not have the submission to Allah Azza wa Jal to begin with. And therefore, this person is in great danger. Now, <clears throat> Having said that, if a person denies one part of Islam, then he becomes a kafir. Because Islam was built and based on these five pillars and the six articles of Iman. Denying one of them makes a person an apostate not part of Islam anymore, maybe part of another religion, but not definitely part of Islam. This is why we always, they exit Islam. Those who say that we only fast 19 days and we face Palestine instead of Kaaba, those are disbelievers. They're denying things that are known by default to be part of Islam. So anyone who says that, no, I'm not going to pay zakat, because it's not mandatory, this is like taxation, like, this is like jizya, he's a, he's a kafir. Of course, 
after fulfilling the conditions and removing the obstacles. But generally speaking, that would be very easy with such a person. But if a person is greedy and he loves money, and who doesn't? Yet his love to money is more than his love to Islam. And he says, yeah, I know that it is mandatory, but I'm not going to pay zakat. Because with the zakat I have, I can buy a new car. And he's got millions. And subhanallah, and this is something I've noticed. The poorer a person is, the quicker he is in giving zakat. And the richer a person is, the slower in giving zakat. Not only that, he would try to calculate ways out of it. Which shows that the purification of the heart is not fulfilled with such a person. Because zakat is means of increasing growth and purification as we've defined this earlier on. So is he a kafir? The answer is no. He is a sinner and he's committing one of the major sins in Islam. Why didn't you make him a kafir if he is not fulfilling one of the pillars of Islam? Because the Prophet said at the end and that person will then take his way either to heaven or to hell. After all that punishment in the grave, he will then be either directed to heaven or to hell. A kafir can never be directed to heaven. He will stay in hell for eternity, which means that the person who does not deny zakat, but rather uh, uh, he withhold it. In this case, he's a Muslim, but he's a sinner and have committed a major sin and would be punished according to hell for eternity. We move on to properties liable to zakat. And this is extremely important. And why is that? So many times as muftis, as people who answer others' questions, I get so many questions about the things that nullify wudu, about the things that break fasting about the things that we have to give zakat over. And I keep telling myself, these people, if they just spent an negligible amount of their time every day to study Islam, well, they could have answered themselves and not need to uh, Tom, Dick or Harry to answer them. People come to me and said, Sheikh, um, I went to the masjid with a pack of cigarettes in my pocket. So is my prayer valid? So I said to myself, okay, why wouldn't it be valid? He said, yeah, because uh, smoking is uh, haram. Okay, but what does that have to do with your prayer? You're clean shaven, and as a man, shaving your beard is haram. So does that affect your uh, uh, salat? No, it doesn't. So this is something that makes it easy for you to make decisions. People say, okay, I smoked a cigarette. Do I have to make wudu? You know that the things that nullify wudu are a handful. So why are you asking me this question? We told you that things that nullify wudu are five. So if you bring a sixth and it's not included, by default, you should answer yourself, Akhi, why are you making things difficult for you? Oh, Sheikh, I brushed my teeth while I was fasting. Does it nullify my uh, fasting? Does it break my fasting? Why would it break? People come and say, Sheikh, I have an expensive car. And do I have to give zakat every year on that? I have an expensive watch. I bought a plot long time ago. And now people are telling me you have to pay zakat for that. Well, you have to learn the properties that are liable for zakat, the wealth that are zakatable, 
and then you can understand and clearly answer yourself without coming to me and asking me questions and this is what we try to tell people expand your knowledge and develop your process or the way of thinking i get so many not intelligent questions but i would say that if the person asking these questions gave it some thought he would not have asked them but the problem is it is so easy to send questions rather than to think and this is what we are trying to change the people from doing yes you can ask the sheikh a hundred that this is the best thing to do when you ask so many questions where you could have spent a little time trying to contemplate trying to understand by yourself that would have been much easier and this is why i always tell those who call me what would you like do you want to fish or do you want to learn how to fish if you want to fish you keep on calling every single day you keep on uh, uh, writing your questions on twitter or to my website but this makes you dependent and this is not positive this is not healthy but if i teach you how to fish and then you go and try your for try it for yourself maybe you succeed seven times out of ten the other three you can come and ask to be clarified and that is way way better than coming ten times to be for many people not intelligent so what are the categories that are properties or what are the wealth that are liable for zakat scholars make them into four and some make them into five the most famous are four because the fifth is quite rare so finding it is not that essential in our lives so we will mention it either way the first category as per the book is the livestock so cattle that includes camels cows sheep goats these are known as livestock or cattle and if you want to sacrifice cannot bring a horse and sacrifice it for hajj it has to be one of these categories mentioned earlier and likewise for aqiqa you can't bring a hundred chicken and slaughter them and say this is my aqiqa it has to be from the livestock so this livestock has conditions first of all it has to reach the threshold known as nisab and each one's nisab is different than the other if i have three camels no zakat four no zakat if i have five camels in this case i have to give one sheep for every five camels that i have and if i have nine camels still i have to give one sheep if i have 10 camels then it goes up an extra sheep so i have to pay two likewise if i have 14 camels i have to pay only two sheep if i have 15 camels i have to pay three and so on so there is a, ta a table stating that for every number of camels i have to pay so and so until it reaches 25 then it goes into camels as zakat instead of sheep and it has different ages for every number of camels that i have as for cows the the minimum the threshold is 30 cows and for every 30 or when once i reach 
the number of 30 cows, I have to give a cow, which is known as Tabir. And Tabir is a one-year-old going into his second, and it's, it's called Tabir because it follows it, which is Thani, which is two years of age. And if I have sheep, if I have 39 sheep that I'm herding, there's no zakat in that. Once it reaches 40, then I have to pay one sheep for that. And it goes on up to 120 sheep. Then I go on to the second level, etc. It's a bit complicated, but this is what the Prophet taught us والسلام, in terms of giving zakat. And zakat, by the way, is not given on any livestock that you keep. So like if I have a hundred sheep in my barn or on my ranch, is there any zakat on that? Yeah, Sheikh, you said every 40 you have to give one sheep. No, 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 no. There is a condition that we have to give zakat. Mm, is it the passing of one lunar year, Sheikh? The answer is no. Okay, Sheikh, I give up. What is it? The sheep, the cows, the camels have to be grazing and not fed. Mm, ex explain, please. I'll explain. If I have a hundred sheep on my farm and they are take them and graze in the open land from what Allah Azza wa Jal has grown up from the grass, etc. Rather, I buy them food and I bring them water. So they feed from the food, from the grass, from uh, the hay that I bring them every single day. In this case, there is no zakat on it. Because the Prophet made a condition that is grown on open land. So if it's not grazing, if I am buying trucks of food for it, there's no zakat in it unless it changes into a category that no, is known as urud al-tijara. If I'm trading with it, I'm keeping it, I'm taking care of it so that I can sell it in the season of Hajj and make money out of that, then there is zakat in it, even if it does not reach the threshold. Because now it turned into urud al-tijara. So I hope this clarifies the first category of wealth that requires attention when giving zakat of course not all of not all of us are ranch owners not all of us have cattle maybe some of us have not even seen a cow or a camel in their lives but it is that we only know about the area we live in, this room I'm in, the neighborhood where I live, my city, as if this is the whole world. And this is not true. There will come a time when everything is back to the future. Everything is dependent on livestock, on farming. There won't be any oil, there won't be any plastics, no fossils fuel, no electricity. All these things we've been enjoying for the past two centuries maybe. But before that, and after that, things will go back to its nature. So, or property, but it would be measured by livestock and this is why it is important to study it to understand it because inevitably it's going to come back one day the second category of zakatable wealth is gold and silver and what takes their role such as banknotes or currencies 
So, the verses in the Quran, as in gold and silver, and how it would become a means of torment to those who hoard it, it's clear. The ahadith, it also is clear. And you can go through this section and read the ayat and read the uh, uh, hadith in it that this is referring to the issue of gold and silver and whatever counts as them. Now, why is so much emphasis placed on gold and silver? Simply because these two precious metals since the beginning of time have been the means of trading between nations, countries, different ethnicities. They all accept gold and silver. Nowadays, we tend to neglect or underestimate the role of gold and silver because we have dollars, we have euros, we have currencies. Not knowing that countries economy depend their currency to increase their wealth not knowing that they are causing a big problem for the whole of the world until we reach a limit where these paper notes have no value long ago like 50 years ago you would find written on a banknote that this banknote is holding the value of so much in silver or in gold. And if you were to the monetary fund or the central bank, they will give you an exchange for it, metal, which is silver or gold. Nowadays, this is not applicable. Countries don't have enough reserve in gold or silver to back up their currencies. They depend on their economy on what they sell and what they buy and what they claim and the economy of the world is in the hands of a number of jews who control the interest rate and the value of currencies but this is not a topic so gold and silver is extremely important it will remain until the end of time do not trust bitcoin or these digital currencies because it's a scam, what comes quick goes quick, and gold and silver remains the most. It may get a little bit sick every now and then, but it never dies, unlike other types of investments. So, Allah Azza wa Jal mandated that we give zakat whenever we have gold, silver, or whatever carries their robe. So what is the threshold of gold? Scholars say of 24 karat gold. So if I have in my position 20, uh, um, uh, 84 grams of 24 karat gold, I do not have to pay zakat. If I have 85, I have to give 2.5% of that after one lunar year is completed. Okay, what about if I have a hundred? Should I give 2.5% of the whole hundred or only for what exceeds the 85, which is the 15 grams? No, you have to give the whole 2.5%. That's a lot of money, yes. But the one who gave you the kilogram of gold also is so generous with you and did not say that this is a lot of money. What about if it's less than 24 carats of gold, if you have 85 grams, but it is 20 carats of gold, there's no zakat. Because the difference between 20 and 24, these four is made of copper of, or other metals. So the 20 carat gold is not 100% pure. It has impurities mixed with it. 
and this is why you have to do the calculation by multiplying uh, the amount you have by 20 and dividing it by 24 and then you will have the actual what about if i have silver okay the threshold of silver is 595 grams of silver the same concept apply less than 595 there's no zakat whatever goes above there is zakat providing that it completed a whole loaner a year in your possession and the currencies are considered to be or weighed or compared to silver not gold why see 85 grams of gold is like maybe 20,000 reals the difference is 10 times if we were to tell people the money you save in the bank or under your mattress if it completes one year and it reaches 20,000 reals you give zakat if you do your analysis you'll find that only maybe 10 percent of the population would be able to give zakat but if you say that if the amount you are saving is 12, 12 2 000 reals and above measuring it by silver not gold you'll find that 90 percent of the population will give zakat so which of the two options is better and more in favor of the poor and the needy definitely the latter and this is why the scholars like Sheikh bin Baz ibn Athaymeen and the, the, the muftis in Saudi Arabia all say that you calculate the value and the threshold of your wealth money wise by silver and not by gold so that it is in the favor of the poor number three commercial goods what is meant by commercial goods in arabic it's called urudu tijara and urudu tijara the vast majority of scholars in you have to give zakat um excuse me can you please define what you meant by trade in meaning that i am specifying this product with this money to keep on buying and selling buying and selling buying and selling in order that everything in the grocery shop is zakatable because yes i do sell uh, uh tomato uh, ketchup i do sell soups i do sell can uh, uh, cans of milk and mushrooms etc but i buy and i refill their places and put things on the shelves for shoppers to come and buy so this is an an in ongoing process where people sell and buy sell and buy sell and buy and this is zakatable and this is the majority of scholars with a and they say that the verse in surah al-baqarah verse 267 where allah says uh, oh who you believe spend on others out of the good things you have earned that this refers to the commercial goods the things you sell and buy now we have that not everything you sell is a catable so if I buy a plot which many of the Muslims do and ask about them Sheikh I bought a plot I bought two plots and I say why did you buy them he says I don't know for the future so maybe like 10 15 years from now I may sell them 
and pay for my children's weddings or I may be uh, uh, I may, may build a house to live in or I may use it to build an apartment uh, uh, high riser and rent it so do I have to pay zakat every year the answer is no Sheikh the guy is storing because we have four categories is it livestock no nope. is it um, gold and silver no it's a property it's a piece of land is it grains and fruit grown from the ground no is it commercial goods that are sold and bought well no don't well me is he buying and selling is he a real estate agent or a company that this is their life yes if i had a company and i had a million euros and all what i do is buy properties keep them for a couple of months sell them buy other properties this is my work and i make money out of that ah in that case there is zakat likewise if someone comes to me and says okay the thing on your head i like this is it for sale i said no it's not for sale i don't go out and sell the things i wear on my head he said okay what about if i give you a thousand dollars be my guest now should i give zakat for that no it's a one timer someone gives me a good price for my car i'm gonna sell it but i don't drive around saying god so this is a very critical way of understanding what you have to give zakat for and what you do not have to give zakat for the fourth category is grains and fruits and it has to be understood that not we would say that almost all types of fruit are not zakatable watermelon oranges uh, apples peaches all of these are not zakatable also vegetables are not zakatable cucumbers tomatoes uh, green leaves of all types are not zakatable so if I have a farm and I'm growing lattice, there's no zakat on that. But if I sell the lattice or the vegetables or the fruit, it becomes part of the third category, which is commercial goods. So I have to give zakat. But for grain, for example, wheat, barley, corn, all of these are zakatable. However, there are conditions for such zakat, and that is it reaches the threshold. And what is the threshold? The threshold is measured in size, not in weight. So the Prophet said, five awsuq, and al wasaq is measured by 60 sar which makes it 300 sar what is a sar sheikh a sar is a container like that we put things in it and we fill it up and this is one sar and each sar is composed of four mud and each mud is what gathers in a normal person's hands so if I have rice and I do this and I fill it up this is one mud and I put it in a container and if I take four scoops this becomes one sar so 300 sar of grain or above it's due on dates it's due on 
raisins coming of course from grapes that's it don't go to other fruits or vegetables and scholars said that the common denominator between these categories is that you can store them and you measure them by weight by size so grains are measured by liter or by sar uh, raisin is likewise dates likewise and you can store them so the poor does not have to eat them fresh he can keep them for a month six months a year whatever and feed on that until the next time zakat unlike a lunar year is not necessary for zakat to be due so if it is harvesting time you have to give zakat so if you harvest twice a year you give zakat twice a year and the amount of zakat is also different than all the others so it's not 2.5 it's either five percent or ten percent five percent is given when there is hardship in taking care of your land meaning that you have to bring water from far away and you have to spend money to irrigate rather than having a stream running by or a west anything and it rains all the time and the streams are close by there's not a lot of hard work or money spent then you give 10 percent out of the crops when you harvest it and it's an issue of dispute whether we have to give zakat on only raisins or also on grapes that are fresh on dates that are dry or also on ripe dates when they're yellow or red and fresh and the most authentic opinion is that you do have to give zakat on that as well. And the fourth, the fifth category, which I said stated uh, before, that it is not of great importance due to the rare occasions that you'll have one, is the mineral resources and rikas. Rikaz was explained to you last lesson and I said that it is the treasure of free Islamic era and I will not repeat what I said you can go and check it out inshallah the zakat is 20 percent which is approximately uh, one-fifth of whatever you find no need for finishing a lunar year the moment you find it you have to give it out as for mineral resources this is an issue of dispute and i think i've discussed it here or somewhere else and said that the hanafi school of thought say that if it's hard then it's zakatable and if it's soft like tar and oil then there is no zakat on it said that you do not have to give zakat on mineral resources unless it is gold or silver and this is the choice of Sheikh al-Sam Taymiyyah and Sheikh ibn Athimin and others and this is the most authentic opinion that mineral resources other than gold and silver that are found and extracted from earth they do not require zakat from uh, uh those who found it find it unless of course if this was for commercial use which is in most cases so once you extract it what are you, what are you going to do with it sell it in this case yes you have to give 2.5 uh, 
percent uh, on that, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. So I think we will uh, stop right here at uh, social effects of zakat. And we move on from last time. I have like five questions and I think that uh, the admins had sent me more questions in the email. So I'll go through them and then check the emails, inshallah. Yasmin Khan says, we are two sisters with one elder brother. Parents want to distribute the property, property as per Sharia. My parents wish to sell all the property and distribute the cash, but my brother wants a piece of the land that is a farm and not the cash. Parents don't want to change their mind. Are my parents right if they don't give that piece of land but sell and give cash instead? I am shocked by the audacity of not necessarily your question yet. Whose property is it? It's your parents. Does anyone have any control over what they decide to do with their own cash or own property? Of course not. So if they decide to sell everything they have and give it to Huda TV or build an institution for da'wah, a school, a masjid, or buy a big building and make it an endowment, waqf. Whatever comes every year from the rent is given to Islamic conferences worldwide. Can any one of you daughters or your brother object to that? Of course not. This is my hard earned money. You have no right in it. After I die, if I leave something, you may inherit it. But while I'm alive, you insist on inheriting me. Billah. What kind of children are these? So the answer is your brother has no right in objecting. On the contrary, he should be grateful that his parents are giving him something now rather than late wait until they die and Allah knows when that would be. Why does he insist on having the property? Because he knows that he'll get it off them cheap. So if they sell it, they're going to sell it for X amount of money and then distribute the money. But if they give it away, they will not give it away as if it is 100,000. They would give it away as if it is 80,000 or 70,000 worth. And he makes more. He should, it's up to you. But you cannot object to them when they're doing something out of their own goodwill as if this is your God-given right. Fatima says, if one fainted out of tiredness of fasting would her fast go a, a, a void or should she continue fasting there's no reason for her to cut her fasting it's like falling asleep does that impact your fasting answer is no so if a person faints before the adhan of fajr and wakes up only after isha in this case, we would say that, yeah, this person did not fast because this was not voluntary and he lost consciousness and he could not attain one second of fasting. Unlike someone who was asleep, in, in this case, a person who's asleep can per se. So to answer your question, Fatim, uh, there is no problem in fainting while fasting and waking up and continuing the fast. Fida Wasik says, charity is 
for fuqara, the poor, who is in Allah's cause, are restricted from travel, trade, or work. The one who knows them not thinks that they are rich because of their modesty. You may know them by their mark. They do not beg of people at all. And whatever you spend in good, surely Allah will know. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 273. The question of Fida, who are these people and what is their mark? These people, they don't have any wealth. They are unable to travel, to trade. They don't have any capital to go to the market. Yet, they're so modest. They are so rich inside. You can barely recognize that they are poor. But you should know them from their mark. From their characteristics. تعرفهم بسيماهم So what is their characteristics? You can see signs of poverty on their clothes. So yes, they're wearing clean clothes, but it's torn. It's like four years old. The fabric is worn out. But they don't have any other alternative. So such is a mark, a characteristic that you can tell. If you look at their feet, you can tell. If you look at where they live, you can tell. These are all marks. Unlike whenever they meet others, they start to whine and complain of the debts they have, the economy, there's not enough money, I can barely pay the rent, my children need this, and, and they keep on complaining. These are totally opposite to whom Allah is describing to us who are so modest, so proud because they believe in Allah and they would never humiliate themselves and beg others. Such people are the ones that you should look for, that you should try to investigate until you find them and then in an honorable way, a dignified way, you help them, you give them money without them feeling broken or humiliated because whatever you put there Bal says how should a woman cover her face with while she's in the state of ihram in order for the veil not to touch her face this is prevailing in the subcontinent unfortunately and some schools of thought may have mentioned this before when they said that in some places in ihram a woman should wear a structure where when she puts the hijab on she won't be touched by the hijab so you find women walking in hajj or umrah with a structure in front of their faces this big so you something like this she wears a structure and she puts the veil on top of it and they say that what's prohibited is for the veil to touch the face and this is totally baseless this is uncalled for never in the quran or the sunnah anything of such is mentioned the only thing in the sunnah is that the prophet said the one wear the niqab and she must not wear the gloves that's it where did you get the idea that touching the face is prohibited i have no idea it's totally baseless so having said that a person should know that wearing such a structure is an innovation. If a woman were to cover her face, she simply wears her normal face cover that is one or two layers so that she can see through it because she's not going to wear the niqab that has an opening for the eyes. She has to cover the whole face. And the sky is the limit. 
And finally, the last question from Umrayyan. She says, when we give fidya, do we need to inform the receiver that it is fidya? And the answer is, the, the recipient of the fidya is poor. But that does not mean that he has no dignity. So when you come to the poor people and you say, this is zakat money, this is charity, this is fidya. By the way, I broke a promise to Allah. This is kafara, expiation. That would break their heart. So you should not tell them what this is. That this recipient of zakat does not accept zakat. If anyone were to tell him that this is zakat money, he says, no, I don't take zakat. I could not give him something that he does not want to have. But 99.9% .9 of all poor people that I know would have no problem in getting zakat money, yet it would not be appropriate to tell people that this is zakat money, or this is fidya, or this is an expiation, because that would break their heart and break them a bit. So uh, this, I believe that we should stop here um, and the questions of last or the questions that came now we will postpone them to next monday inshallah so until we meet then i leave you fi amanillah wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh